Hi, I'm Morgan Plager Roth, and I work at the East Adams Library District as the local history library assistant. And today uh, I'll be presenting Boots on the Ground, Winning the Vote in Washington. Now, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to the Washington State Historical Society and the Women's History Consortium. Uh, they were the ones who funded a grant in which I was able to create this presentation. So thank you very much. Now, what we wanted, women wanted suffrage. They wanted universal suffrage and they wanted um, uh, the right to vote in political elections. Uh, as you can see here, uh, Henry Mayer created this. He entitled The Awakening. And you can see Lady Liberty coming across the United States because by 1915, much of the West had actually granted suffrage to uh, the, the female citizenship. Uh, it was really the Midwest and the East where women were still working for suffrage. Now, the 19th Amendment states the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Of course, um, this was passed in 1920, which is why I'm here, because it is the 100th anniversary, our centennial, uh, August 18th to be exact. Um, now, while the words uh, will not be denied or abridged, uh, makes you think that this was given to all women. Uh, that's patently untrue. Uh, white women were largely the target of this amendment. And in fact, uh, Native Americans uh, were not considered citizens until 1924. Uh, Chinese immigrants did not get voting rights until 1943. First generation Japanese Americans were not granted voting rights until the McCarran-Walter Act of 1952. And of course, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 ended poll tax, the grandfather clause, and other intimidation tactics used against uh, uh, Black Americans. So of course, Washington, which is the focus of this presentation, uh, Washington really had an interesting road to franchise. Uh, we had gained and lost the right to vote twice before 1910, and we in fact nearly became the first state to grant women suffrage. Uh, in 1854, Arthur Denny, who was a big, uh, a big proponent of suffrage, uh, made the first uh, motion and it lost by one vote. Uh, Susan B. Anthony and Abigail Scott Dunaway led the push again in 1883. Uh, with the territorial supreme, uh, which then the territorial supreme court overturned it in 1887. Uh, they passed it again. The legislature did passed it again right away in 1888. But in the lead up to us becoming a uh, a, a state in 1889, the ter territorial supreme court overturned it again immediately. Uh, so really, what was going on? Uh, in the rest of the nation at the time. Uh, Wyoming passed uh, as the first state in 1869, Colorado in 1893, Utah and Idaho in 1896. So those years between 1893 and 1896, there was a lot of momentum and moving around. Uh, but then we had a 14 year dry spell and not until Washington came along did we get the ball rolling again. So by uh, 1909, 1908, 1909, Washington, uh, the women of Washington and then also the women nationally had really put together a, uh, a coherent strategy uh, to push suffrage through. Um, the women uh, of Washington state uh, knew that the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition would be the first World's Fair in the state in Seattle. And so they held a Women's Day on July 7th. And interestingly enough, um, the National American Women's Suffrage Association also decided to hold their annual convention in Seattle, uh, sort of in, almost in conjunction with the AYP. Uh, so NASA saw an opportunity to really bring uh, the idea of suffrage to Washington and, and they decided to hold their, their uh, convention there. So one of the things that the women did was to really bring attention uh, to bring attention to the uh, suffrage in Washington was to hire a train uh, going from uh, east to west and on the train the tra train arrived in Spokane on June 29th and uh, or excuse me it left Spokane on June 29th at 2:30 in the morning and it was packed with women um, they called it the suffrage special or some called it the yellow special because uh, so much yellow was uh, being worn by the women 
um, to promote suffrage. And so uh, many of the uh, very prominent women of the suffrage movement nationally and statewide were on that train. And in fact, um, Emma Smith DeVoe, who was our statewide president for the Equal Suffrage Association, uh, was really um, the mistress of the train. So Emma Smith DeVoe, like I said, the president of our Equal Suffrage Association, uh, she was incredibly skilled at what she did. Uh, she was mentored by Susan B. Anthony, uh, and she was an excellent organizer, excellent coalition builder, and a fantastic fundraiser. Uh, she had worked in South Dakota, Illinois, Kentucky, and Ohio, or excuse me, Idaho, uh, before she came to Washington. She, uh, her and her husband both lived uh, in the Tacoma area. Now, May Arkwright Hutton, she uh, is a very interesting character. Uh, she uh, was born in Ohio, uh, was raised middle class to poor, kind of, and uh, she came out west and um, by herself and married her husband and they invested in the Hercules mine, which struck silver, and they became overnight millionaires uh, in Idaho. And uh, she very quickly uh, turned to become a philanthropist. Uh, she worked incredibly hard her whole life as a fair labor activist, even as a mine owner, and she was also a writer. Uh, but one of the things that she did was that when she was in Idaho, she could vote, um, but her and her husband decided to move to uh, Spokane to build a house on the South Hill. And basically what happened to her was as soon as she crossed over that, that state border, she lost her right to vote. And she found that incredibly insulting. So one of the things about um, uh, the strategies that were being used uh, for women to, to really work towards um, suffrage was uh, one strategy was called the Still Hunt Strategy. Uh, Abigail Scott Dunaway, who's the mother of the movement in the Pacific Northwest, she worked her entire life to, um, to promote suffrage and got it passed in Idaho and Washington before Oregon finally followed suit after something like eight tries. Um, she, uh, she, her pitch and her strategy was to convince women to work on the husbands, fathers, sons, and brothers in their lives to convince them that they, um, that women should also have the right to vote. So it was a very like one-on-one -on -one strategy where you speak to your husband and, and try to convince him to vote. Uh, she uh, passed through Ritzville on October 12th of 1885, and this is what she wrote about our area. The short afternoon wore rapidly away. We awoke at Ritzville and Washington Territory. It is lazy work this all day riding through these mighty solitudes. I just thought that was a beautiful way to describe our area at the time. Now, of course, um, Adams County was pretty sparsely populated. Uh, you know, it, I shouldn't say sparsely, but it was it was pretty small at that time. And uh, so the Adams County, but the Adams County women were very involved in the suffrage movement, um, especially for being such a rural uh, farming community. Now, this photo here is Adams County Day at the AYP that we spoke of earlier, and it was September 15th of 1909. And about the photo, uh, these are all citizens of Adams County. And uh, one of the newspaper articles stated that it, uh, the, the people standing in the photo represented 75% of the families that, that lived in Adams County at the time. So, gal pals. Uh, the equal, an equal suffrage club was formed in Ritzville. Uh, Emma Smith DeVoe came to, uh, came to Ritzville specifically to organize a club. Uh, they had approximately 30 members and they elected officers that night. Now, um, most newspaper articles at the time uh, describe women only by their husband's names. So of course, to find out who these people were, you have to do a little bit of genealogical searching. Um, Mrs. W.F. Stanley was May, and uh, we're gonna talk uh, quite a bit more about her later. Um, but then of course we have Mrs. A.S. Newland was Sarah Frances Hickman who one of the women uh, who lives in Ritzville today, uh, that is her grandmother. And an interesting story that she told was the fact that 
her grandmother had never spoken about the fact that she had worked as a suffragist. And that seems to be a story that, that continues to be told over and over again. Um, JD, Mrs. J.D. Bassett was Alice Case. Mrs. W.J. Bennington was Myra Myers. Mrs. W.H. Martin was Eloise Baker. And uh, Mr. O.R. Holcomb, or Mrs. O.R. Holcomb, was Eva Stacer. And Eva apparently was an excellent pianist from what I found out. So the um, Emma Smith DeVoe um, papers are online and uh, they are fantastic. Uh, really great research uh, or resource when I was researching this topic. Um, some of the letters uh, to and from Ritzville um, on uh, the 3rd of March, 1908, May Stanley wrote um, to Emma Smith DeVoe, I find that a number of the ladies are a little shy on the suffrage question, um, but they respond readily to the study part of our work. And really what she's saying there is that, that uh, these women were um, homemakers. Uh, they lived in polite society and basically they were they were not women who were agitators who were looking to um, demand rights they they just wanted to get to work and they wanted to be able to um, learn educate themselves and get in, better involved in their communities um, but we know that after March, uh, sometime in the fall of 1908, May Stanley left Ritzville. She moved with her husband uh, up to Wilson Creek in Grant County. And so what happened after that was um, that Mrs. Martin wrote to Emma Smith DeVoe when, when Emma wrote to say that she wanted to come back to Ritzville to um, work with the group. Uh, she wrote, after consulting the few ladies who are the club's actual membership, it will be quite useless to arrange for a meeting here in Wrightsville. So we know that May Stanley uh, almost certainly was the backbone of the group and she was the one who was really advocating and working for suffrage in the area. And so once she left, then that was when the women, ha um, the, the membership itself sort of fell apart. Um, but by October of 1910, just a month before uh, the vote, uh, the state vote, uh, Sarah Smith Abeglin, who was the wife of a local doctor, she wrote um, to Emma Smith DeVoe's secretary, Ellen Luckenby, and she said that she'd be happy to hand out cards on election day. And one of the strategies that the women uh, really worked for was to, uh, or really uh, did in, the, in leading up to the election, was to print cards um, basically advocating and asking the men to vote for um, Amendment 6. Um, so, of course, we have uh, the, the coalition building that I mentioned uh, Emma Smith DeVoe was so good at. Uh, there were uh, several coalitions within the state uh, that were formed and uh, really pushed for suffrage uh, for women. Uh, three of them were uh, labor unions. Uh, one was the Federation of Labor, one was the Farmers Union, and of course there was the Grange. And um, uh, each group at their state convention in 1910 uh, passed a resolution to endorse suffrage. And one of the kind of fun ones that I found in the state Grange, they have uh, in their archives the one of their committees uh, instructed voters to vote for amendment, uh, the amendment to article number six, and to vote for women's suffrage. But kind of one of the interesting things is that uh, the, the people on that committee were largely women. Uh, you have Frances Sylvester, Bernice Sapp, Jenny Jewett, uh, Mary McKillop, uh, Lewis Guernsey, which is the single man, Alice Farr, Augusta Keegley, and Ada Lewis. So women were already involved in the political process in their, uh, in their different groups and organizations, but they were looking to uh, push their, their, um, their process further by, um, by becoming fully involved. And of course, one of the other groups that was big supporter of uh, 
of suffrage was the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, small groups like the, uh, like the Equal Suffrage Associations and the Equal Suffrage Clubs uh, that were in towns. They also had many Women's Christian Temperance Union or WCTUs um, that met regularly and pushed for temperance and to end the consumption of alcohol. And the leader um, and figurehead of the movement was Carrie A. Nation, who my favorite um, nickname for her was the Curse of Kiowa, Kansas, because that's really sh where she started her reign of terror uh, by picking up a rock and throwing it through a plate glass window and then going in and smashing as many liquor bottles as she possibly could. Uh, she exchanged her rock for a hatchet and uh, basically went on tour for, for much of her life. And she uh, visited Spokane and gave speeches there at the, the uh, Methodist Church, I believe. And um, from there, she announced she was going to Ritzville. And that's when a frantic call was made, a long distance call from uh, Spokane to Ritzville to publish a note in the, in the journal, our local newspaper, that she would be um, coming to Ritzville and to basically batten down the hatches. Um, the journal, which was pro-temperance, uh, in fact, actually, uh, it was kind of interesting. They, they wrote, the journal trusts that Mrs. Nation did more good here than we can at this time discover. Uh, basically, they were a little unimpressed with her, uh, her long speech. Um, some might call it rambling, um, but she was very much uh, in the paper. She, she states that you know, she boosts suffrage, but that she also believes the women of 1910 were, um, were immodest and, and she railed against alcohol and immodesty for much of her life. Uh, but she came to Ritzville at a very, um, a very important, important point because by the end of the month of May of 1910, uh, Ritzville and Adams County at large would be voting on the alcohol question and deciding whether or not to have alcohol in, in the area. So like the still hunt strategy, like the suffrage special, uh, one of the things that, that women did to boost suffrage was to hold parades, um, to create spectacle. And uh, this photo I love, this is Inez Milholland. Uh, she led the 1913 suffrage parade in Washington, DC. Uh, it was the largest parade that Washington, DC had ever seen at that point. Um, Spokane also had its own parade, uh, the Spokane Interstate Fair Women's Day, and the in, held in conjunction with the National Dry Farming Congress, or I should say the Interstate Fair and the National Dry Farming Congress were held together. But on Women's Day, um, Jesse Atkinson, who was a, a big proponent of suffrage um, in in Eastern Washington, she worked. Uh, she worked to basically create this parade, which would lead people from downtown out to the fairgrounds. And um, uh, one of the things that she advocated for was that Native women uh, lead, head off the parade, and lead it. And because of the racism of the time, uh, there was a huge pushback about that, and they attempted to cancel the the parade itself. But she she won out. She held out. And she became, uh, and, and uh, native, uh, local native women did in fact lead the parade that day. Um, one of the other interesting things about uh, like this photo here, this woman is my great, great grandmother. The man next to her is my great, great grandfather. Uh, this was a photo that was in my family collection. Uh, we always thought it was really interesting. Uh, my great grandmother didn't know exactly what year that it was taken, uh, but she did remember her mother talking about being involved in the Svea Sisters Club. And so we just assumed that it was, uh, you know, them winning the first prize in the Interstate Fair um, in the parade. But it turns out the Svea Sisters, which was a Swedish women's group, uh, they also were working for suffrage, and uh, and so they uh, they were in this parade advocating for suffrage, and so that was kind of a cool thing. And and much like the woman, the other woman I was talking about, um, many of the women uh, were working for suffrage, not just to vote, but then to become politically active. So like that. Uh, 
the Ritzville parade and the vote that I was talking about earlier, Ritzville held its own parade uh, early May. Uh, they held a local option parade. The local option was deciding whether uh, alcohol should remain in the communities or not. Uh, you can see over here where um, it says both sides are working uh, quietly and nonetheless thoroughly. There it is. Uh, both sides are working quietly and nonetheless thoroughly and surely. Uh, and then also that registration is unusually heavy um, and there are many more to register, uh, but uh, it states too, the record of each new name on the register will be probed to the bottom to ascertain his qualifications and right to use the franchise, which, um, is interesting language and and they are just trying to make sure that the men that were voting were supposed to be voting uh, this photo itself you can see the women and children in the parade um, they are mostly wearing white as a sign of purity and if you know Ritzel at all you can recognize some of these buildings the Gritman building the trading company building uh, many of the buildings that are still there today now the uh, the women that were working for temperance uh, and advocating for the vote they in fact uh, they managed to sort of win um, the uh, women are working to sway the vote against the saloons you can see that there uh, and they they did okay uh, Lind and Ritzville retained their saloons uh, but the outlying areas of the county, uh, places like Paha, Hatton, uh, Cunningham, uh, Ralston, they all lost their saloons uh, because of the vote. And as far as the statewide vote is concerned, here are our results. Now, uh, Adams County, you can see that 61% um, voted for uh, the amendment, Spokane 55% for the amendment, and statewide it was even higher at 63.8% uh, voted for the amendment. But if you'll get into the numbers, it's kind of interesting because 1,431 total ballots were handed out in Adams County that day. Only 46 or 46% of them didn't even answer the question. And the number was even higher in Spokane County. 57% of the men that voted that day in fact, did not answer the question yes or no. Uh, they just skipped it entirely and left the question to be answered by someone else. Uh, statewide, I didn't have the full uh, ballot total, but um, it's pretty impressive that the women won the vote by such a large margin, 63%. If you get that vote, uh, that's a good day. So I wanted to show the, the constitutional change. Uh, here you have the, well, oh, lost it again. Where is, there is my mouse. Okay, so uh, the constitutional change is there shall be no denial of the elective franchise at any election on account of sex. That is the change that was made to the Washington State Amendment, um, and or excuse me, to the Washington State Constitution. Uh, but one of the interesting, there's several qualifiers here um, showing who was allowed to vote. You had to be over 21. You had to be a citizen of the United States, of course. Uh, but that also you had to live in the state one year, in the county 90 days, and in, in the city, town, ward, or precinct for 30 days prior to that. Um, at that time in 1910, it was pretty hard to provide, uh, you know, written paperwork unless you had a friend or somebody who could vouch for you to to prove that you were that you were allowed to vote um also you had to read and speak the english language um adams county is a county that was largely settled by uh german and germans uh from russia who were not native English speakers who often did not learn uh, the English language right away. And so uh, that was a huge hindrance to people being allowed to vote. And then of course, uh, more racism. Uh, you have Indians not taxed shall never be allowed the elective franchise. Uh, so those were some of the, the laws that were written in um, to keep people from voting. So I mentioned May, uh, May Stanley earlier. This is a picture of her from a book release that she had. Uh
she led a wildly interesting life. Uh, my, er, I found the earliest I found her was in 1907, having moved to Ritzville with um, her husband, and he was he worked at one of the local newspapers. Um, in by 1908, she was uh, the president of our local organization, the ESA. The Ritzville ESA, and she spoke at the 1908 uh, state convention. Now, one of the things about her is that she, uh, her and her husband moved up to Wilson Creek, where you can see W. Stanley, W. F. Stanley, or Wilbur F. Stanley. He was the editor of the newspaper. But also, she is listed as the editor of the newspaper in the 1910 census. Uh, it's pretty incredible that, that this woman uh, served alongside her husband and, and was also an editor of the newspaper. Um, from Ritzville, they moved to Wilson Creek in Grant County, where, excuse me, uh, uh, where they were both obviously um, editors of newspapers. She organized a women's league uh, in Wilson Creek. She also, um, she also organized one in Pasco. Uh, she was working on uh, uh, beautification projects um, in, in the Pasco area. And then um, the interesting thing is by December of 1911, there was a newspaper notice that Mr. F. Stanley, um, W. F. Stanley, uh, the editor of the Pasco Progress uh, is leaving the town and there's no mention of his wife. And I thought that was really interesting. I worried that maybe she had passed away. Um, it took a while to find her, but uh, May Stanley um, and her husband parted ways. He moved back to Canada where he was from and she moved on from, uh, she was in Spokane for a short time, I believe, and then she went to Duluth. Um, she be created her own very successful writing career um, and was in Minnesota for many years. She married again, so I don't know if she was ever married to her husband or if they just sort of walked away from their marriage, but um, she married again. And tragically, um, he passed away from tuberculosis not uh, eight, eight or nine months uh, into their marriage. So she uh, then took a job. She was offered a job by uh, with Musical America, which is a publication that still prints today. And, um, and she moved to New York City in 1915. She continued to write for the, uh, her her Minnesota newspapers back home. She'd send dispatches about life in New York City, especially during World War I. And then she joined the war effort. She wrote patriotic songs. She served on a board with Carrie Chapman Catt, who is inarguably one of the most famous suffragists of, of American history. Um, she also attended a suffrage school that was put on by the New York Suffrage Association, um, where it taught how to become involved in politics, how to speak to the public, um, and basically how to advocate for suffrage. Um, she then also went down to Washington, D.C. and st uh, stood in as a silent sentinel uh, in January of, 19, uh, of 1917 in front of the White House. And, oh, just before, let me, uh, so anyways, uh, the Silent Sentinels of 1917, um, the women, uh, uh, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns were two women who learned uh, their advocating for suffrage, uh, learned tactics from the British suffragettes. The British suffragettes um, had an incredible time trying to get suffrage uh, for for women in Britain, and um, they used some very um, militant tactics. And uh, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns both decided that that was what, what they should do. And so they uh, cracked a plan to um, make banners and stand quietly in front of the White House just demanding that the president um, give women suffrage. Um, the idea of picketing at the time was rare. Um, it was it was a tool that was being used to some extent in uh, mining and labor organizing, but the idea that women would do it was unheard of. And um, and so in January of 1917, when they began, um, they the public largely could not believe the women were doing this, um, and they it was seen as an embarrassment. Uh, to the president to have the women standing out there. Uh, men who walked by spat at them. 
they were treated incredibly poorly for, for standing there. And by October of 1917, uh, they had decided to start um, order, or, uh, picking up the women on loitering charges and sending them to the Acoquin workhouse. Um, and the entire thing ended in, a, in the night of terror, um, which I'll talk about in just a second. But I wanted to say just a little bit about what Mae Stanley was doing. She was there um, in, the, in the early days, um, in January of 1917, before the war started, before um, the women were, were being mistreated. And what she wrote back to Minnesota about it was, I think the silent picketing is the most impressive thing the women have yet attempted. That big yellow banner with the inscription, Mr. President, what are you going to do for woman suffrage? May be impertinent, as some of the opponents of the equal suffrage say, but it's mightily evident of the earnestness back of the plan. She was a big supporter. In fact, she stood, um, she held a sign. Uh, for a while one day while she was there visiting the women, um, and she was very excited about it. Um, her friend Edith Fitch, who traveled to New York City and met up with her, and then the two of them are from Minnesota, and then uh, they headed down to Washington, D.C. Now, the Night of Terror occurred in November when the women were beaten and abused. Uh, it was apparently a horrific night, and so wh what happened was uh, up until then, the women were deemed unpatriotic by the newspapers, and largely the public was was not okay with the women picketing. Uh, when the public found out about what was going on to these women and how they were being mistreated, uh, the sentiment turned around very rapidly. And in fact, uh, one year to the day, um, Congress passed the resolution to um, move forward on or pass the, the amendment uh, to move it forward towards ratification. So you can't argue that that was not a uh, successful strategy. Now, May Stanley went on to have an incredibly successful career. Um, she, uh, while she was in New York City, she wrote uh, profiles of many of the most famous people of the time, uh, largely uh, the women of the time. Uh, Tamaki Miri, who uh, was Madame Butterfly, she wrote a, um, an article on her, The Zimbalist Family, um, artist uh, couples uphold feminist beliefs, um, saying that, that uh, home and a career is not incompatible. Uh, she wrote about Emmy Destin, who was a patriot uh, and a political prisoner during World War I. And then, of course, she wrote about uh, Jeanette Rankin, who was from Montana and the very first woman elected to Congress. And one of her long running jokes in her articles was, uh, a woman's place is in the house, uh, the house of Congress. <laughs> so I can move forward. Now in wrapping up um, the grave of the forgotten suffragist, um, many of these women, uh, they didn't spend a lot of time talk about their uh, about what they had done for suffrage because once they got the right to vote then they moved forward on a lot of other um, issues that they wanted to um, make their lives and the lives of their children and their families better um, so like Mae Stanley who because she didn't have children uh, she was largely written out of history and I believe I was probably the first person to sort of go down that rabbit hole and look for her um, you know, the, the women's grandmothers and great grandmothers and great great grandmothers who um, they never knew that they worked for suffrage because those women then turned around to make their communities better. Uh, the women were working for temperance. They were uh, working towards old age pensions, legislative reform, prison reform. One of the interesting things about it is just the sheer number of women that were involved in the suffrage movement. It was quite literally millions of women. <clears throat> and um, the, they were working for children, for educational opportunities, uh, food in schools uh, to lower infant death rates, uh, and also labor reforms. They were hugely involved in labor reform movements, uh, eight-hour workdays, safety regulations, children's labor. And of course, post-World War I, you have the World Peace Proposal. So the women of Ritzville, to get back to something a little bit more local, um, the very first election that they were able to vote in, uh, they voted um, in favor of um, in favor of a school bond to build a brand new school. So 388 ballots 
were cast, the incredible number of 311 were cast for the school, which is insane. Um, and then also just the fact that 150 women cast their ballots that day. So half of, half of the votes, nearly half of the votes were uh, cast by women. Um, and the newspaper, the journal reported, uh, give women the ballot and she will show the keen in interest in all things pertaining to civic uplift, cleaner and better government. So um, again, I would love to say thank you to um, the Washington State Historical Society and the Women's History Consortium. Um, and then also, uh, if you get the opportunity, in fact, do it right now, because we're all at home together, uh, go visit Suffrage 100 WA. It is a great resource um, for all the things that the, uh, they're trying to do in Washington State to really uh, draw attention to uh, the women that worked for suffrage. And then also I would like to say thank you. Uh, again, I'm Morgan Plager Roth. I can be found, uh, I can be emailed at morganer at ritzvillelibrary.com. And then of course, go visit our library's website um, and as soon as you can, go visit the actual library. It's beautiful. Um, but yeah, eastadamslibrary.org. Go check it out. Thank you.